Okay, welcome everybody. My name's Lynn Humdy and I am the co-creator of Making Work Work, which many of you will be familiar with and I can see some of our alumni on the call. Um, it's a programme that supports women who have had a career break to return to work that is meaningful and is commensurate with their skills, abilities and aspirations. I'm also the founder of Flexible Work in Scotland, which is a community on Facebook of over 13,000 people across Scotland looking to work flexibly, recruit flexibly and advocate for greater flexibility and equality at work. And I can see here that we've got some um, women who've also um, participated in our spin-off programme. So at the moment, we're just coming to the end of a couple of pilots. One is LEAP, Learning, Employability and Purpose, where we are placing women um, in pro bono project roles in social enterprises. Um, and we are also training them and training the host organisations. Um, that's just coming to an end. And we're also running a programme just now called Ready to Rise, which is for women who have a bit of an inkling that they might find their ideal work-life blend by setting up um, a business with purpose. So that might be a charity or a social enterprise or even um, a purpose-led business. Um, and we've been working with those women to work out their skills and their ideas and hopefully bring them a little bit closer to starting something for themselves. So welcome everyone. This mini session is about focusing your job search. So today I'm going to be focusing on four key points. Oops, sorry. So um, I'll be suggesting that you develop a checklist that is personal to you for your job search, that you think carefully about where and how to apply for a job, that you do something to start building your confidence and that you ask for help. So by being here this morning, you're already accessing some help that is available to you. So on the first point, develop a checklist. Um, job titles are not always the best um, indicator of whether a job is for you. They are not in any way regulated or um, nor do they have any norms. So, you know, you might be looking for a role as a an account manager, and that will mean different things to different employers. And also, it's particularly difficult if you are returning to the workplace after a break and you don't actually know what you're looking for. So how can you Google what you're looking for if you don't know how what you're Googling? So um, one way that we advise on making work work that you can kind of break that impasse is by developing a checklist. And those of you who were at an earlier one of these webinars who or who've participated in a previous um, making work work will recognize this Venn diagram. You need to narrow down what it is that you're looking for. And I think often what um, the women we work with are facing is not a lack of job opportunities or an absence of vacancies. It's often overwhelm at everything that's out there. And when you start looking at job ads, on big websites like Indeed or S1 Jobs, it just gets to the point where you can't see the wood for the trees. So you need to be filtering them in a systematic way that works for you. And that will be individual for everybody. Um, you know, everybody's different. So work out what is important to you. A lot of the women we're working with want to do something that is more purposeful, they perhaps worked for um, a private sector company earlier in their career, but now want to give something back or they realise that actually they want to be working for an organisation that values them for who they are and the stage of their life that they're at. So it's maybe offering flexible working. Um, you might have an idea of a particular sector you want to work in. You might um, often, sadly, um, women we work with have had a bad experience in one particular sector, so don't want to go back there. I would say um, not all employers are equal, so you might find a more positive employer in the same sector. 
Um, and often we're working with women who have children or other commitments in their lives that are non-negotiable and they need to be thinking about getting a balance between something that's doable and isn't going to completely take over their lives but also that has a bit of challenge or an opportunity to learn or an opportunity to develop so you need to figure out what is important to you and take a bit of time to do that and this Venn diagram might be useful to you we um talk about working on your terms so that means um, the working conditions and the working patterns and the contractual arrangements and the terms and conditions that would work for you we also talk about values passion and purpose you can find lists of values online but you know if there's something you're really passionate about and you want to to have that featured in the work aspect of your life then figure out what that is and resource engine that's a term that comes from um, some work done around building businesses. But that's really about what motivates you, what gets you out of bed in the morning. Because for women returners particularly, if you're going to have to re-jig everything in your lives to fit work in, then you better make it work that you want to get up in the morning and go to. Otherwise, you're making your life a little bit more complex for not much return. So really think about what is important to you. But you also need to think about what you can offer an employer. And that is really about your experience, your qualifications, but above all, your transferable skills. Um, a lot of you on this call will be a bit older. If you did a degree or whatever you did at school will be quite a long time ago. And you probably will have used aspects of that but it's probably not like when you first finish school or university, the thing that you use to sell yourself. Your transferable skills are absolutely critical. So we've all got work and life experience. Um, and for transferable skills, it really doesn't matter how you gained them. It doesn't matter if you learn your um amazing organizational skills working in oil and gas but now you want to work in a charity or you learnt your fantastic communication skills working in an ad agency but now you'd much rather work in the public sector so it's really not important where you gained them what is important is what you've done what you can do and you need to gather together some evidence to prove that and when you're looking at job ads, they will list the skills or the competencies that the job requires. So once you have your checklist of what you're looking for and your checklist of your transferable skills, you can compare what you want and what you have to offer to what they're looking for. And there's a bit of a I think it's really become a bit of an urban myth now that women won't apply unless um, they meet 100% of the spec. And I think the research that underpinned that has now been discredited. But I think there is something about wanting to be the finished article before you apply. But the thing is, most employers, A, don't put everything that they want in a job ad. It's really a shopping list. Um, and, you know, you might go to the shopping list and think, oh, actually, I quite fancy that. So when you're in front of an employer and you say, oh, I can also do this, they might think, actually, that would be really useful. We forgot to put that in the job ad. So um, a job ad is not necessarily a full, complete list. Things change. Recruitment processes take a while. People might leave in between. By the time you get to an interview, they might actually be looking for exactly what you've got to offer. But also, um, a lot of employers will be looking for somebody who can grow with them. So they'll be expecting to provide a certain amount of training. Hopefully, they'll be expecting you to grow and progress. So don't be put off if you don't satisfy every single last detail of the job ad. If you can demonstrate your ability to learn, to grow, that you've maybe done something a bit adjacent to what they're looking for, or you've maybe done a bit of genning up on some LinkedIn learning, that will show them that you're keen and you're passionate and you're capable. So what do we mean by transferable skills? So here are some examples. And as you can see, 
they are not specific to any job or any sector. They are skills that you may have gained throughout your working life and perhaps also outside of work in volunteering or in other um, things that you do that you can bring to an employer. So you need to think about what transferable skills you have, but also how you can demonstrate them. So when you're writing your application or your CV or you're in an interview and you're having to give examples, you know, that classic question of give us an example of when you've used your problem solving skills. Think about how you can demonstrate them with hard evidence. You know, I've recruited quite a lot of people in my time. And some, if somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm a good problem solver, I want proof. So think of a situation or a scenario when you have solved, for example, a problem and talk about your results. I think often we undersell ourselves. We think it's a bit sort of show offy or we're boasting if we say, well, I did this and I saved this much money or I achieved these results. But how is an employer going to know unless you tell them? They're not psychic. So be ready to talk about your achievements, your results, the money you saved, the efficiencies you made, whatever it might be in relation to your transferable skills. So now you have a checklist and your checklist consists of your priorities, what is personally important to you. And you can find out if these chime with um, employers you're looking for, you're looking at, because you can go on their website, you can check them out on Glassdoor, you can find somebody who works for them or has worked for them, and you can kind of test. Um, use your networks. You know, if you're looking at a company and you're like, yeah, but yeah, are they all they really say they are? They've got nice words on their website. Try and find somebody you know who's worked there or somebody you know who knows somebody. Start doing some research and narrowing down your job search. And then the other side of your checklist is your skills. So what you can offer. And once you've got that checklist, it will help you eliminate a lot of jobs. And that might sound scary because you're thinking, oh, I just got to get a job. But actually, it's going to make your job easier. What you need to be doing is focusing on fewer applications of higher quality. So quality over quantity. If you've got any questions, feel free to um, ask them at the end. If you think you might forget them, um, stick them in the chat and I'll come back at the end. So our second tip on narrowing your job search is about where and how to apply. And if you are not a standard applicant, you are unlikely to be successful using a standard site. And what I mean by that is if you've had a career break, if you've come to Scotland from another country, if you have maybe had quite a squiggly career and you can't sort of show that you've climbed a ladder, which is absolutely normal, particularly for women, that they don't their careers don't climb ladders. If um, you maybe need something that needs to be taken into account, it is unlikely that you are going to find your dream job on a big jobs website particularly if you need flexible working. And of course, you can filter things down and you can by all means have a look at those job sites. But I don't come across a lot of women and on Making Work Work, we've worked with about 250 women now and, and our, you know, including our spin-off programmes. Don't find a lot of women who find a job by just flinging a CV through a one-click application process. And the disadvantage of those one click application processes is they are too easy and recruiters are often absolutely inundated with applications. And what that means is you aren't able to build a relationship with that um, organisation because they won't reply. They haven't got time. And I'm seeing a massive trend in employers ghosting applicants. So. My recommendation would be to try and find the employers that you're really interested in working with 
And if possible, try and build a relationship with them. Find someone who works there. If there's someone, it's somebody's name at the bottom of a job ad, give them a call, drop them an email. Their details are there because they are ready to talk to you. And similarly, recruitment agencies may not be your friend. They are in the market of supplying as many candidates as they can to as many clients as they can. For that reason, they will collect your CV, they will collect all your details, but you may never hear from them. They want easy hires. And I don't mean to say that you're not an easy hire, any of you who are on this call, but as I say, if you have had a career break or you are trying to change direction, for a recruitment agency, you might be a little bit tricky. The other thing is recruitment agencies typically work on a model of maximizing their commission. Now, that's great because it would maximize your salary because their commission is particularly a percentage of a salary. Maybe not so great if you're not looking for full time work because your salary will be less if you're looking to work part time. Now, all is not lost because if you need flexible work, for example, there are specialist boards. If you're looking to apply it for charity, if for work in the third sector, there are specialist boards. If you're looking for a public sector um, job, there are specialist work um, websites, and that already is narrowing it down for you. Um, but in my opinion and my experience, my observations of the women's women that I've worked with, it is not a numbers game. It's a game of strategy. And um Laurie McPherson, who's a career coach you can find on Flexible Work in Scotland, and she's a friend of Making Work Work. She says, spraying and praying doesn't work. So we get women who come to us and say, I've sent hundreds of applications and I never hear back. I would, and my advice is always send fewer applications and really make them stand out. Research and follow employers that you would like to work for. and um, you know, I totally accept that some a lot of people will be like, well, I know I don't want to do what I did before, but I don't know what I do want to do now. And that is fine. If you're experienced and or you've had a break, you can clarify what you're looking for and your position in the market through conversations. A conversation does not oblige you to anything. So if you think, oh, you know, my friend works in that company, I wonder what they're like. Have a chat. And you might be like, you might think, oh, gosh, no, definitely don't want to do that sort of work. Or you might think, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I, might, I might look them up online and see what they're all about. Sitting and stewing and thinking is seldom the way to move forward. And it can be quite overwhelming to gather a lot of information, but eventually the mist will clear. So for some tips on where to find jobs, particularly if you're looking for flexible working, um, obviously Flexible Work in Scotland on Facebook, um, that's a great place to find jobs. Uh, if you find if you see jobs that you're not interested in, you can post them there for others. You can seek support. We get a lot of questions, people saying, oh, I've, I've got an interview with this organisation. Has anybody I had an interview with them before. I'm thinking about that company. Has anybody worked there before? Just ask questions. You can ask them anonymously if you want to. You can also provide support and that will help you realise that actually you've already done quite a lot of research. You do know a bit about the labour market. You're not actually fumbling around in the dark. I'm also always posting um, intel on the state of flexible working, getting a bit of a discussion going, reassuring people that flexible jobs are out there. And um, I quite often share campaigns that group members can take part in. I've also written um, an e-guide on where to find flexible working in Scotland, and that has got a list of lots of useful websites, jobs platforms, um, private, public and third sector um, and that's available on Kofi. Another way you might want to find out which um, companies and organisations are good ones to work for in terms of flexible working is that there have been um, some awards given recently. So um, Flexibility Works are a social enterprise that 
support employers to work more flexibly, they had their last awards ceremony um, and process in 2022. So as you can see here, there are um, employers from the public, private and third sector um, who are offering um, good flexible working practices. You can also look at the Herald's Top Employers Awards and Flexibility Works is now sponsoring a category there. So you can see here again, um, a real mix of employers. Um, on the, if you were on the webinar last week, you will have heard Andrew Senyu, who runs um, Home Instead, a care company, saying that a lot of companies don't even apply for rewards, are too busy getting on with what they do. And that is true. So other places you can find out about flexible working policies of employers are their job ads, their websites, um, you can look at TimeWise, which is a consultancy that promotes flexible and part-time working. Look at Glassdoor and ask around. You know, if flexible working is on your checklist, you can't work for an employer that isn't flexible. So find out who they are. Our third tip is build your confidence. Now, that's easy to say, but not necessarily easy to do. But you start in your comfort zone and gradually expand out. So start speaking to your friends, your family. But the more people you speak to, the clearer your focus will become. And remember, we're talking about narrowing your job search. As I said, um, earlier, it will feel a bit like information overload, but then you will see a path through. You don't have to have all the answers. What we find on Making Work Work is that quite a lot of women hold themselves back until they know a, an answer to a certain question. But and if you don't know something, you are going to have to go and find it out. And you don't need to know the answers. You just need to know the questions to ask. And as I said earlier, a conversation doesn't bind you to anything, but it might put you front of mind. You know, if you have a conversation with somebody around, well, I used to do this and I learned A, B and C. I think I'm really strong in those transferable skills. And I'm just looking for how I can apply those skills. You might just be front of mind when that person has a vacancy. You may need somebody to create a role for you. Or you may need somebody to identify in you what they are looking for. But if you're sitting at home sending out job applications by the dozen that you're not actually particularly interested in, that's going to be hard for somebody to do. So you are going to need to get out there. And you, as I say, start small. Start in Flexible Working Scotland. If you've done Making Work Work, start in your cohort and gradually expand out from there. Um, when on Making Work Work, we do a whole masterclass on confidence, um, but these are some distilled tips from that. Um, first of all, if we think that we need to have more confidence in order to get, be successful, we're kind of setting ourselves up for a very difficult task. It might even be impossible. You can't just become confident by thinking about becoming confident. You have to try things and reflect and think, oh, actually, that was OK. That wasn't too bad. I didn't die, hopefully. Um, and we, we sometimes put important steps forward on hold because we're waiting for confidence to rain on us from above. So you just take baby steps. and keep reflecting and it doesn't matter if something doesn't work out you've learned something confidence typically grows outside your comfort zone i know for some people that is quite tricky particularly if you're neurodivergent you might be dealing with quite a lot already but in doing things that you think oh i'm not really sure about that but i'll give it a go that's how confidence grows Please stop aiming for perfection. I heard somebody say, um, I think it was on our, maybe it was on our um, Making Work Work International Women's Day event. Perfection doesn't exist. 
you have this idea of perfection you might get there and think oh yeah but I just need a little bit more just you know what I'm looking for is just over the hill forget about it perfectionism and procrastination are the most um I would say the two things that are very very tightly bound together and by striving for perfectionism and procrastinating and waiting until you get there you're actually um, holding yourself back and if things don't work it doesn't matter one of our um, speakers on a making work work masterclass said fail stands for first attempt in learning we learn from our mistakes we learn from other people's mistakes and so really building in a bit of reflection around um, what could I do that is manageable and what did I learn from that can really help. And finally, lots of scary things are less scary if you break them down into baby steps. You know, if you think, oh, I really want to get a job as a whatever, that's quite big. But if you think, well, what do I need to do first? I need to find out about what it's like to work um, as a whatever. I need to find out who employs whatevers. I might actually have a chat with a friend and think, see, see if she thinks I might be good at being a whatever. I'll look online and see what skills whatevers need. And if I've got those skills and, and if I haven't, then I might need to think about where I could get those skills. You know, and just breaking things down makes them seem much more achievable. But we're not always very good at bigging ourselves up. And um, you may have heard of limiting beliefs. And these are a state of mind or a belief about yourself that puts yourself down or limits you in some way. And examples include, I can't even read this, it's so small. <laughs> um, oh, it's so competitive, I'll never get in there. Or, oh, I'm not, I'm not really good enough to try for that. Or, Oh, I might do that and not succeed. And well, then everybody's going to laugh at me. Nobody's laughing. They're all too busy with their own nonsense. Um, oh, I, I, yeah, no, I might, I might, I might not manage that. So I, I'm not going to try that. These are just thoughts. They're not reality. They are just thoughts in your head. And this graphic, I came across it recently. It's by um, Gemma Gilbert, who's a coach. And I follow her online and she recommends to create distance from your thoughts. So you might be thinking, I'm a failure or I can't do that. But if you try and create a bit of distance, you might think you might be able to get yourself in the headspace where you're thinking, I'm having a thought that I'm a failure or that I can't do that. And then you might be able to create a little bit more distance. You might be able to think, I'm noticing, I'm having a thought that I'm a failure. And if you can insert at that point, having a thought, but that's not real, that's just a thought, then you can start to overcome some of these self-limiting beliefs. It's not easy. And for some people, it will be harder than others. But also listen to what the people around you say. You know, I come across a lot of people, not some people who say, I've been invited to an interview for that job. I don't know why they've invited me. Well, because they think you can do it. So borrow a bit of confidence from other people. If you've got a friend who says, do you know, you're really great at communication. I saw that uh, email that you wrote and you've got a real skill at that. Just borrow their confidence if you haven't got any. They think you're great. Right. So just believe them instead of your own self-limiting beliefs. And our final tip is ask for help. If you have been out of the workplace for a while, if you feel a bit lacking in confidence, if you feel that your skills are a bit old and rusty, maybe you feel like nobody wants you in there in the organization. Ask for help. Um, I'm a big fan of Brene Brown's work 
around um, mindset and compassion and vulnerability. And she says, if you judge yourself for needing help, you judge those you are helping. So maybe you're the kind of person who always provides help, but you might be thinking, oh, God, how did they not know how to do that? If you think that of them, you'll be thinking that of yourself. But if you attach value to giving help, if you genuinely believe compassionately that you can help somebody to improve, to develop, to achieve something, then you can attach that value to you yourself needing help. So what Brene Brown says is offering help is courageous and compassionate, but so is asking for help. So in short, don't judge yourself for needing a bit of help. You cannot know everything. None of us can. But you can tap into somebody's knowledge, somebody's network, somebody's support, somebody's confidence in you. You might do that in a group setting, like Making Work Work. You might do that in an online setting, like Flexible Working Scotland. You might do that in a one-to-one -one setting with a coach or a friend or a family member or a former colleague. But, and you don't need to ask the same person for all the help and they probably won't be able to give it to you. But you can ask for help and people are often happy to help, especially people who identify with your situation or who think, well, why, why shouldn't somebody else be able to do what I do or why shouldn't somebody else have what I have? So um, don't assume that other people are judging you for needing help. That might be you judging yourself. So who can you ask? You can ask in Flexible Working Scotland. If you are a former Making Work Work participant, you can ask in the alumni network. You can, ask, If you are a Making Work Work alumna, you can ask the team who's best to ask if you're not sure. Ask former colleagues. You might be thinking, oh, but they all work in a bank and I don't want to work in a bank anymore. That may be the case, but they have transferable skills. They may be recruiting managers. They have partners and family members and friends. So, you know, don't shy away from speaking to former colleagues just because you don't want to work where they work. They might have moved on as well. Ask friends and family. Typically, they are the people who have your interest, your best interests at heart. If you're on LinkedIn. You can ask on there. Look at who you're connected to. Look at who they are connected to. They're the people who come up with a little second beside them. You don't have to do anything cold. You don't have to send emails into the ether. You don't have to cold call anybody. You know a lot of people. If you're comfortable, you can attend networking events. Um, I run networking events. There are lots of them out there. They don't even have to be in person. They might be online. If you have a mentor or a coach, and if you are unemployed and you've been on Making Work Work, we can get you one. Um, ask them. Who else could you ask? There will be other people out there who you can ask. And have an open mind. Be open to opportunities. You might need to take an intermediary step before you go into your dream job. But as long as you do that in a decisive, strategic way, that's OK. You're still on your path. And as a friend of mine says, follow the crumbs. You know, take one breadcrumb, see where that leads. Go to the next one, see where that leads. You know, if you never know what's out there, but unless you put yourself out there, you won't know. So, overall, there are four things I'd like you to leave today's session um, with in your mind. You only need one job. It's a bit like marketing, although for some, some of you, that will probably make you think, ooh. -hoo. But you only need to appeal to the employers who are most appealing to you. I know that a lot of people will, be, will say, oh, I just want any job. Do you really? I understand that for some people there will be a financial or another imperative that means you really need a job, even if it's not your dream job. But even if you really need any job, 
you are still going to have to convince an employer that you are passionate about that job. So you only need one. Focus your time and effort on applying for roles that you can really get excited about. Think about what flexibility you need and focus your search on employers that offer it. I get asked a lot of questions about when should I ask for flexibility? Well, why not find an employer who you know is offering the flexibility that you want? Be absolutely clear on your transferable skills. That will help you sift out a lot of um, job offers. But don't count yourself out if you're missing one of the skills. And your values will help you narrow your focus. If you, for example, have had mental health issues in the past, you will probably want to work for an employer who values what people can offer despite any health issues they've had. You might even want to work for an employer that supports people with mental health issues. If you um, really want an organisation, if you're, one of your key values is learning, find an organisation that's going to help you to learn, that's going to develop you. Think about what is really important to you and that will also help you narrow your focus. So today we have covered four focus points. Checklist, thinking about where and how to apply, building your confidence and asking for help.